Why do you hate Elmo so much? He's a cringing little milksop of a puppet. I like the Jim Henson puppets. They all had an edge. They were funny. Jim Henson was funny. He was a terrible stoner. And you could tell that in Sesame Street. Yeah, I you mean, could. We used to sit around when I was a teenager and get stoned and watch Sesame Street. I mean, oh, nobody could invent the Count who hadn't smoked like eight pounds of weed. Dad, welcome to my podcast. Thanks for the invitation. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Where are your Uggs? <laughs> These are my backup slippers, man. They look like backup slippers. They do. Yes, they certainly do. They're <laughs> not the ugliest slippers I have though. This is true. Okay. Last week you talked about, you had a story about how much you were being paid at Harvard and how that was difficult because mom was staying at home and you just weren't being paid very much. Mm -hmm. And I wanted you to tell everybody about that. Well, when I was a assistant professor, so there are three tiers of professor, assistant, associate, and full. And assistant professor is the beginning position. And generally you're tenured, which gives you some job security at associate. And then there are a few more perks that come along with full professor. Um, I started as an assistant professor at Harvard and it wasn't necessary for Harvard to be particularly competitive on the salary side of things, despite the fact that they have untold billions in their hedge fund. Harvard's really a hedge fund now, by the way, and not a university. Sneaky. So yes, well, be careful what you wish for, you know. Anyways, I wasn't paid enough as an assistant professor at Harvard to support a family in Boston. And I worked, I'm not complaining about this. It was a great opportunity to be in Boston, mm -hmm. but Tammy didn't have a green card, so she couldn't work. And we spent no money. I had a, like a, the most rat box of a car that you could possibly Rackaby. imagine. Rackaby. Rackaby, yeah. I mean, that car, the doors literally fell off that car two weeks after we sold it to our neighbor. Now, they, the neighbor, by the way, knew that the car was in that bad of shape. So I think we traded it to them for partly because we got their Cadillac. Anyways, we didn't even buy magazines. We, we had no money. And uh, I had to teach extra courses. So I taught two extra courses per semester, which is a lot because you, you're full loaded, especially if you're doing research, is three courses in total, three or four across two semesters. So two per semester. I taught twice that much. Oh. And one day I phoned the dean and I said, well, this is... I phoned the dean and I said, I don't know what's going on here, but like, I can't, I'm having a hard time getting my research enterprise up and going because I'm teaching so much. I don't have enough time to attend to the research. And I don't mind that because I love teaching, but like, what the hell, how do you justify this? And he said, most of our people consult, which was not true. Many of the senior faculty consult, but to consult, well, first of all, you have to be established somewhere for a long time and you have to have a reputation. And like, it takes a long time to build up a consulting enterprise. It's not something you just step into overnight. It's like a decade to build a consulting yeah, operation. Just to it's get, very just hard. to get patients. Well, well. Or not patients, well, but clients. Clients, yeah. Yeah, right, right. And uh, I wasn't practicing as a clinical psychologist at that point, although I was licensed. Anyways, that's when I started the enterprises that became exam core um, because I was looking for something I could capitalize on uh, that I knew about that would be useful, that would be economically productive. You know, and that took off. It took a long time. Like we didn't really make profit with exam core for 15 years. Or and that that's longer. understand myself. Yeah. And, and uh, self-authoring. Self -authoring. Yeah. Yeah. So. I just thought it was interesting that uh, I didn't realize that I don't know if it's still the same now, but I didn't realize that that's how little money associate professors can make even at Ivy League Assistant. institutions. Oh, definitely. Assistant. Yeah. Is it still the same? Um, I don't know. I would Things suspect it's similar. Things are a lot similar. more expensive now. They'd have to be paid quite a bit more for it to be the same, I would assume. Right, because I imagine the, well, the housing market is certainly more expensive now than it was. I mean, Boston's housing market was very expensive when we were there in the 90s. That had already started. Although we did... We did buy a house when we were there in a working class town in Arlington, very nice working class town. And we could afford that just like barely. And we had loans from our parents for the down payment, at least partially from our parents. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it was fine. We just didn't have any money. Like the thing is your poverty isn't defined by your money precisely. Your poverty is defined by your opportunity. 
right? And so if you don't have any money, but you have lots of opportunity, you're rich. You just don't have any money. And you can have lots of money and be poor. I mean, that's, I wouldn't say that's the normal run of things, but it's certainly a possibility. Partly because money isn't the solution to many of life's problems. It can help it's the though. solution to <laughs> some of them. Some of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a list of questions. I usually take some from the audience, but there's only one in here from the audience. Uh, so you talk a lot about keeping families together and how two parents, a man and a woman are ideal for a child. Minimal, when they're the minimal necessary arrangement. So like two wives is better. <laughs> you mean two wives that <laughs> better than a single mother? No, I meant two wives and a husband. You yeah. said minimal, minimal arrangement. Right, 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 right. That well, was a then, joke. Yes, yes, yes. You have to find two wives who would get along with each other and that's technically impossible. So. <laughs> Hey guys, if you didn't know, my dad's going on tour for his upcoming We Who Wrestle With God book. If you guys like the biblical series on YouTube, you're going to love this. Tickets are available at jordanbpeterson.com. And honestly, if there are any of the lectures you guys should go to, it's one on this tour. It could change your life. Listening to dad's lectures brought mom closer to God. And I think that's what he's hoping to do for people. I'm not sure what other lecture you can go to that's trying to deliver that. Mom's going to be opening for him, and hopefully I can come along to some of the shows, but we'll see how baby George and my sleep feels about that. Tickets are available at jordanbpeterson.com for shows in the U.S. starting in February. There are also meet and greet tickets still available. I hope you enjoy this episode. Um, how do you know when divorce is the right option? Well, I would say that's all things considered up to the adults involved. Right. I don't know if there is a rule of thumb that generally what you see, and this used to be encoded in law, is something like irreconcilable differences. So we've had family members who got divorced because one of them wanted a child and the other didn't. Mm -hmm. Well, possibly you could negotiate, negotiate around that, although <laughs> it's not simple. It's a pretty fundamental difference. And so, you know, and then I would say, repeated actions of bad faith on the part of one of the people and that would be repeated indication that negotiation in good faith is impossible repeated patterns of deception that's a really bad one um, i suppose there are probably instances of profound temperamental incompatibility i think it's very difficult for example to take a relatively value free big five dimension if you're insanely creative and interested in ideas, so high in trade openness, and the person you're with is very much tilted in the other direction, finds no interest in ideas, has very little aesthetic sensibility, that's a very difficult uh, difference to overcome. There's no real negotiation there. You know, if, you're, if one of you is 80th percentile and the other is 30th percentile, that sounds like a huge difference, but it's not 99.9% compared to point one, it's not one in a thousand different, you know, you're kind of in the normal range. Well, then you can, there's some room for negotiation and expansion on the part, let's say of the less open person and maybe some appreciation for the norm and what's more conservative on the part of the more open person, you know, because mm -hmm. openness isn't without its downsides. Open people can easily be scattered all over the place and interested in way, way too many things and be dilettantes and, and be flaky, especially if they're not good at distinguishing good ideas from bad ideas. But if you're really different on any given temperamental dimension, that makes the corresponding communication much more challenging. Like it's very, very hard for someone extremely extroverted to be with someone extremely introverted because their yeah. whole orientation to the, to the social world is opposite. Disagreeable, I've seen this with men and women, you'll get a very agreeable woman who's quite feminine and a very disagreeable man who's like hyper masculine and they can't communicate. I wonder, that happens a lot. I wonder if that's part of the reason this red pill community has taken off because a lot of the people who are figureheads in this community are extremely disagreeable, like probably first percentile in disagreeableness. And what mm -hmm. they teach other people is men can really be friends with other men because they understand each other. Yeah. Men can't be friends with women at all and can't even really communicate with them. That's kind of what they teach people. I wonder if that's a personality trait. 
Well, I, I like think, hyper, well, I think that like hyper masculine men have a hard time communicating with hyper feminine women. Definitely. But this is where the gender issue becomes more complex. The radical leftist claim is that there's a, there's no limit to the number of genders there are. And that's actually true, even though they're stupid. <laughs> well, they're stupid. They don't know what they're talking about, but there's an element of it that's true because the, the cardinal elements of gender difference in personality are agreeableness and neuroticism. So the typical hyper-feminine woman is extremely agreeable and high in negative emotion. And the typical man is disagreeable and low in negative emotion, right? So, and there's positives and negatives associated with both that. An agreeable person is very much concerned with the feelings of other people, you know, is concerned with others. And you can see that as a virtue, although hyper-agreeable people tend to be resentful because they don't ever put their own interests in the, they don't put them forward properly. And it's also the case that there are far more agreeable people going to therapy to become more disagreeable than there are disagreeable people going to therapy to become mm. more agreeable. Right. So, and then with is regards- Is that because they're disagreeable though and won't go to therapy? Or is it well, because it's I more think, beneficial to be disagreeable than it is to be hyper agreeable? Well, I think that being very agreeable carries with it that terrible burden of of continual martyrdom and self-sacrifice. And, and I don't think that if you're trying to make your way in the world as an individual, that that's, there's definite disadvantages to that a prior position. One of the reasons women don't make as much money as men in comparable positions to the degree that that's true at all. Like there's, that's not true if you compare single men and women in their mid twenties who are childless. In fact, the women actually have a bit of an advantage, but but insofar as there are gender differences in payment for position, one of the contributing factors is that women are more agreeable. And agreeable women won't go to their boss and say, give me a raise, you son of a bitch, or I'll leave. And like I can imagine, like men will have a conversation just like that, even if the guy who's making the claim is the subordinate. You know, if, if the, and that's a disagreeable mode of communication. It can be overlaid with humor. You know, and then with, you might say, well, what's the advantage of high trait neuroticism, the proclivity to negative yeah. emotion? Well, it's threat sensitivity. And if you're a mother of infants, being threat sensitive is unbelievably useful because infants are extremely vulnerable. And so you should be alert to threat. You're alert to snakes. Well, what's the downside? Well, you're always afraid it's of snakes. Miserable. That's the downside. Well, yeah. Well, of course, of course. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have its adept adaptive utility, but it's still the case that if you have a disagreeable man who's very emotionally stable and a hyper agreeable woman who's emotionally, you know, who's, who has a pronounced proclivity for negative emotion, it's going to be very difficult for them to communicate. There's other temperamental differences between men and women too. So if you look at extroversion, men are more, so extroversion is assertiveness and enthusiasm. Okay. Men and women are about equal in, in extroversion. But women are more enthusiastic and men are more assertive, so it breaks there. And then in openness, openness breaks down into interest in ideas and interest in aesthetics. And women and men are about equal in openness overall, but women are higher in interest in aesthetics and men are higher in interest in ideas. And you can see that reflected in the fact, for example, that YouTube is primarily a male domain. And that's because it tends to focus on ideas, at, you know, the, the, the more upper echelons of YouTube, let's say. So, and men are more, in, this is why men read nonfiction instead of fiction. It's the same reflection. And so you can imagine a woman and a man who have virtually no overlap in personality. Mm -hmm. Right. Now that's going to be relatively rare because most of the traits overlap quite a bit. But in some, you could imagine that you could categorically distinguish them while they'd have a hard time communicating. Yeah. So. This plays nicely into, so, so two things. One. We won't touch too much on this because we can talk about this later, but we do have an idea to build a dating app that right. looks at the temperamental differences and personality between men and women and matches you based on that. Yeah. Uh, and a number of other. Yeah. Factors. Well, the, the, the empirical literature suggests that it's easier to get along with people who are similar to you in personality. And part of the reason for that is that part of the way that you get along with people is by sharing interests and activities and, what interests and activities you find compelling are going to be a reflect reflection of your temperament. Yeah, we'll look into that too, though. We could... Well, with, with dad and mom, my dad and mom, for example, dad's an avid hunter. 
you know, a dad's relatively disagreeable, which is one of the things you need to be, to be a hunter, as it turns out. And mom is very agreeable and she's not interested in hunting. And you had a bit of that. Oh my gosh. We went gopher hunting one time. Yeah. It was Julian and I, when we were kids and I don't think I'd have this issue anymore. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have this issue anymore. I think this is partly because I was depressed. Mm -hmm. Uh, a, A large portion actually, I think was because I was depressed, but we went gopher hunting because gophers destroy farmers' lands. Mm-hmm. So they actually want you to come and hunt gophers. And Julian's shooting gophers like left and right. He's probably seven or something like that. And when you shoot them, they scream. Mm-hmm. They scream this high pitched scream. Yep. And I sat in the car with my hands over my ears. So I was probably nine and cried. Right, right, right. Well, when I used to go hunting with dad, I was too tender minded for it too. So tender hearted? Yeah. <laughs> Tenderhearted, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but but I, but but that's a good example of how temperamental difference can you know make make a relationship difficult, more difficult because there's no overlap in apparent there's little overlap in apparent interest, mm-hmm. you know. And Tam used to encounter that with her dad. Her dad was quite an entrepreneurial character, but he wasn't one of the world's most aesthetically sensitive people. He had no interest in art whatsoever, right? And, and he just he just thought it was a practical waste of time like many ah. conservative people think. And, you know, she'd haul him along to a museum and his attitude was, what the hell are we doing in this museum? And why have we been here for so long? <laughs> right. And that's clear reflection of, of different in, difference in interest. You know, your mom and I are well matched in that regard because I might be more open than she is, but maybe in some ways, She's, likely in some ways. In some ways. In some ways, yeah. Yeah. She's well, for a long time, open. I was. She is. She is. Well, she's certainly op- open enough so that that isn't an impediment in our relationship, and she's very adventurous. Mm-hmm. So, you know, her and I are quite well matched in temperament. She's probably more, less neurotic than me. I would say, maybe, maybe. I think, and probably. I think, I think there are some. Well, we'll have to like gather data and see, but I feel like there are some personality traits that can be significantly different. And can still line up. Like you couldn't put two neurotic people together. No, no, that would. Like, that's why lesbian not. relationships don't last. Well, what is that's why? That's going to get clipped. It, well, it is why. <laughs> it is why because about 75 percent of divorces are initiated by women, and the simplest explanation for that is that on average, the most unhappy person in the relationship is going to be the woman. Well, why? Well, because on average, she has higher levels of negative emotion. That doesn't necessarily mean that that negative emotion doesn't reflect problems in the relationship, but she's going to be more sensitive to that. Well, so if you put two women together, well, you know, what do you think happens? So, I mean, it's one of the reasons. It's not the only reason. The red pill community twists that too, saying like most divorces are initiated by women. So women are the problem, which I don't think. No, that doesn't, that doesn't follow at all. It could be that you know, men are the problem and women just pick up on it. Now it's not. I mean, the right attitude there is obviously that on average it's 50-50. Yeah. And and even if you're thinking about that biologically, it's For the sure. only answer that makes sense. It's like, yeah. well, men and women, they, they co-evolved. Yeah. So there, there's no, it's men that are the problem. It's women that are the problem. That's just ridiculous. It's yeah. ridiculous. Hey guys, so last year, before I discovered mold in my house causing all my issues, I had my hormones tested on the off chance I was having a hormone issue, which I was. My hormones were flattened, like all of them. They recovered somewhat after moving out of that house, given I got pregnant a month after I moved out, after not getting pregnant for a few years. Um, But I wanted to talk to you about the company I use to test my hormones, Merrick Health. They're my go-to telehealth company for labs, hormones, peptides, physicians that don't suck, They gave me an in-depth look at my hormones compared to what you'd get at a regular doctor's office. You can sign up and choose what you want to get tested or choose some of their panels and they give you your results broken down and recommendations for supplements, peptides, or treatments that work. They're super easy to work with, very straightforward. You get all your information. I'm a huge proponent of monitoring blood work. I think everyone should do it. My husband's now working with them, my dad, my brother, and me. They do work other than hormone optimization, like cognitive enhancement, hair loss prevention, body recomposition. The complete package includes the same elaborate panel I got myself and actually just redid. So we'll see what it shows now that I'm not living in mold. And with those test results, the Merrick Health clinical team suggests ways to optimize hormones. 
To get the exact same panel and medical oversight I got, click the link in the video description or go to merrickhealth.com slash Michaela and use code MP to save 10% at checkout. Highly recommended, pinned in the description. I hope you guys are enjoying this episode. You wanna hear the audience question? Sure. Why do you hate Elmo so much? He's a cringing little milksop of a puppet. He's whiny, he's false, he's, he's fake, nice. There's not, he, he wasn't a Jim Henson creation, by the way. I like the Jim Henson puppets. They all had an edge. They were funny. Jim Henson was funny. Like he was a terrible stoner. And you could tell that in Sesame Street. Yeah, I you mean, could. We used to sit around when I was a teenager and get stoned and watch Sesame Street. I mean, oh, nobody could invent the Count who hadn't smoked like eight pounds of weed. A cookie you know, monster. Or the cookie that, monster, like, exactly. What is that? And so Jim Henson was a hoot and the Muppet Show was very funny. Elmo's like this, Elmo's like the politically correct puppet of the Muppet troops. And that whiny voice just grates. Everything about that bloody puppet grates on me. Elmo, sickening puppet. He's got particularly politically correct on recent years in Sesame Street too. I saw some clips lately about him, one of his puppet friends decrying systemic racism for four-year-olds. Oh. Sickening. So, no, Elmo's, well, plus, if I remember correctly, yeah. there was some untoward behavior on the part of his a puppeteer. Little. Yeah, a little. Yeah. Yeah, surprise, surprise. I thought, well, nobody could see that coming whose eyes were open for 20 years. <laughs> okay. Stupid puppet. Advice for people getting- He sounds like that <laughs> horrible character on Star Wars, that Miso. Oh, I uh, know. Is it the little bear thing? No. Well, there was always an Star annoying Wars character well. like that in every Star Wars movie for a while. Um, I don't remember. He had eyes out on the side of his head. Anyways, <laughs> he's the same character. It's like, I'm, oh, and that, they even did that in Harry Potter with that bloody- Oh, Dobby? Oh, God. Dobby and Elmo are the same creature. <laughs> Not Dobby. Yeah. Dobby was annoying. Very. Yeah. Yeah. Advice for people getting over a breakup. Well, take some time. To like don't contact the other person? Well, generally for the psychiatric, on the psychiatric end of things, if you're grieving, generally the psychiatric psychological community has agreed that something like a year of grief in a... In consequential to a severe loss is well within the realm of normative. So it's going to hurt. Um, so don't be too impatient with yourself. I would say, what else? What else do you need to know? Cynicism and bitterness are not your friend. Um, that person isn't reflective of women. The person you broke up with isn't reflective of men. That's not helpful, right? So you don't want to overgeneralize. I don't think you want to leap back in any too soon. And you might spend some real time thinking about not so much what the other person did wrong, even though there's nothing more satisfying than that. You should spend some real time thinking about what you did wrong, especially if this has been a pattern. You know, I noticed when I was in college, I broke up with three girls, I think, in the space of six months, something like that. They were relatively short-term relationships, you know. But they, they all ended the same way, more or less. And I don't even remember the details. But I thought, oh, that's not them. Mm. That's me. And, you know, it took me a while to sort out what it was. Part of it was that I had a tendency, to, this is very common. In fact, I'm sure it's overwhelmingly the norm. Maybe women do this too. God only knows what women do. But I had a tendency to put any woman that I was attracted to on a pedestal. Mm. And that was hard on her. And also, you know, put me in a demeaned position immediately, which was also not attractive, by the way. And so that was an anima problem, technically, and it took me a while to sort that out. Actually, my perception of women changed when I sorted it out, it changed overnight. I, I saw one really interesting example of this. So I don't know if I can explain this properly, but maybe I can. If you put the woman that you're attracted to on a pedestal, what you're really attracted to is your unconscious idealization of women. And men see their unconscious idealization of women in someone they're attracted to, especially if the attraction is pronounced and immediate, right? That's a projection, psychoanalytically speaking. And then they confuse the woman with that idealization. 
which is very difficult to bear for the woman because she's not really there. That's the first problem. And second, she's going to get herself in trouble and not know it because now and then she's going to do something that violates that ideal projection and be called to account for it, even though she doesn't know what rules she's breaking. Plus, the guy won't be able to listen to her or appreciate anything about her that's not perfect or in accordance with that ideal. So that means she can't really talk to him, right? She can't reveal anything that's untoward or... That definitely makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that is probably common for people. So, so one of the things that happened when I solved that problem, I was studying a lot of Jungian psychology at the time, it literally happened overnight, is I can remember walking down the streets of Montreal and I saw an ad on a bus. And you know, at that time, this was in the 80s, they're probably still doing this. A lot of the models that were used by like makeup companies were very young women, like 14, but made up, you know, so oh. they were sexualized. Well, it's still the case. Like there's very young models who were used, you know, but, but I know that before I had seen through my own illusions that I would have seen in the ad a beautiful woman. And then I saw a girl dressed up like a woman. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Well, there's a loss in that too. Like the loss is, this is a loss of maturity, is that, you know, if you are in love with your ideal, then you have the ideal, like you have the princess. The price you pay is you don't get the woman. Now, if you want the woman, the price you pay for that is that you have to let go of the princess. Right, right. Now, that's what you should do, because the princess thing isn't going anywhere. But it is definitely a sacrifice. It's sort of like growing up and coming to the realization that your father doesn't know everything, which of course isn't true in your case, by the way. But it's, it's, there's a loss in that, right? Like the gain is that you gain the maturity and the self-confidence yeah. to go out and make your own decisions. But the loss is that you had a figure who was an intermediary between you and the world who knew everything. Lots of people who remain over-dependent on their father, for example, remain over-dependent. They're willing to exist under his thumb, even if it's rather tyrannical because they don't want to give up the certainty that there's someone out there in the world who actually knows what's going on. Yeah, that's so, scary. Of course, of course. That's interesting. Okay. So that's what, not to like still stick on this red pilled mm -hmm. community, but they're, they're, in, they're interesting. I find it. Yeah, in, yeah, it's it is like, interesting. It's very strange. Well, it's, it's the beginning of a kind of backlash against idiot feminism. Like yeah. a wide scale backlash. Yeah, it is. It's the opposite yeah. in an also toxic way. But... That's what these people are looking for is the princess. And then the problem with the red pill community is they're telling all these young people that the woman they want to look for is the princess, mm -hmm. like the, literally a virgin. Well, well, um, well, and part of the problem with that too, is there's a maiden whore thing. That's a problem there too. So there's, you could think of, there's two archetypal representations of women. There's more than two, but here's two and they're on opposite ends. And one is the virgin mother and the other is the, you know, the, the stripper whore, right? And you might think, well, if you're going to get married, you want the virgin mother. Well, sometimes, right. Well, so then, and sometimes maybe the stripper whore is the preferable object. Well, now, how do you bring those two together? Well, you have, there has to be a sacrifice, right? There's a sacrifice of purity, certainly. And part of the reason that couples, men, remain sexually unsatisfied in their marital relationships is because, you know, virgin mother is for their wife and whore is for their stripper girlfriend. Well, that's not very good for the stripper girlfriend because she ends up like, you know, cocaine in back alleys. That's fun for her. And it's not so good for the wife because her idiot husband is flandering around with sluts. And so that's real fun. Plus she's like boxed into her little ice box mm -hmm. refrigerator mm -hmm. life having to be picture perfect like a stepford wife all the time yeah right it's very unsatisfying for everyone involved this is partly why jung what would you say was so insistent upon integrating the shadow so one of the things you have to do to have a marriage that's successful is admit what you want and some of that's well what was the freudian stance the hardest motivational, the most difficult motivational drives to integrate into a socialized personality are, is sexuality and aggression. Well, obviously. 
and that produces a real challenge. But if you can get it right, well, it's a huge benefit, but it's very difficult to get right. You know, and it's part of the whole, how do you, how is it that you maintain respect for a woman in the light of, what would you say, the full range of sexual activity? Well, that's a hard, that's a very difficult human problem, right? But it's manageable, it's just, it requires a certain amount of sophistication. So, and, and it's hard. Mm. But it's, it's not nearly as hard as the alternative, so... Well, one of my questions was when, when men and women, so separately, when they're looking for someone, what qualities for, should they look for? Mm -hmm. And I, I think like one of the mistakes young people make is people can be insanely interesting, right? In all sorts of different ways. And they can have, like you said, this kind of mother virgin personality, and then they can have this like whore personality as well. And having this range makes them interesting mm -hmm. and keeping your like getting with somebody interesting is how you keep this relationship going. Yeah. So for young men looking for someone, thinking that they need this ideal person, yeah, it's what too they narrow. need is, it's too they need narrow. someone with range. Yeah. Well, that's part of maturity is that, well, and that's part of subduing the world. So God tells Adam to subdue the world, essentially. You know, and all the eco-freaks think that means, you know, rape and pillage Mother Earth. It doesn't what it means. It means everything in its proper place everything properly categorized. It's part of the action of logos. And what you do in a good relationship is you put everything in its place, right? So there's a time for virgin mother and there's the time, there's the time for, you know, sexual licentiousness and everything in its proper place. That's the crucial issue. Same with aggression. It's not that it's to be repressed. It's that it's to be subdued. It's to be put, intellect is the same thing. So Milton characterized Lucifer as intellect gone wrong. And intellect's a great gift. It's a great talent. And it is God-given. That's the simplest way to think about it in many ways because it's highly genetically determined. Highly. Now, no one likes that. And it's no wonder because it's a rather dismal fact of life. But so it's a gift. Now, you might say, well, how can the world be a fair place if some people are given this great gift of intellect and others aren't? And, and the range of people in terms of their intelligence is, it's, it's staggering. It's staggering. You know, like I've tested people on IQ tests who have IQs of say 80, which is about where cognitively impaired starts from the perspective of the definition of such things. And you, you just can't imagine what, if you're literate, you can't imagine what someone with an IQ of 80 doesn't know. They wouldn't be able to name the world's oceans, that's for sure. They certainly wouldn't be able to if you gave them a globe where the continents weren't distinguished from the water. They wouldn't be able to tell you the difference between the water and the continents. Hmm. So, and that's 10%. It's more than that. It's about 10% of the population. And so... Anyways, how do the cosmic scales balance given that some people have an IQ of 150 and some people have an IQ of 70? Massive difference. Well, partly along with intellect comes pride and the probability of it going wrong. And there's nothing, there's no one more narcissistic than someone who's smart. And if you are smart, that's a real temptation. It's a real temptation. It can make you bitter as hell. The most bitter people are the smart people who aren't successful. Because they feel that their, yeah. their shining light wasn't given due course and that the world should fall at their feet and didn't. Those are dislikable people. Oh, unbelievable. That's comic book guy on The Simpsons. Like they, they, <sighs> they nailed it with him. You know, he and he's smart, but that's not enough. And, you know, so the way the world works, you don't get a gift without a corresponding temptation. And intellect is certainly, it has the same characteristic you can go very spectacularly wrong if you're smart. And it's pride that does that. So now I don't remember why we were talking about that in relationship to dating. I don't remember why we were talking about that in relationship to dating either, but maybe it's not important. We were, we were, we were on the who to look for, yeah. but... Eh. Oh yeah, we were talking about range. We were talking about range. Well, one of the things that happens, and I still don't know how we got into intelligence, one of the things that happens as you mature is that your 
personality variability increases, right? So maybe you have a set point, you're extroverted. And when you're a kid, if you're extroverted, you're always extroverted. You're extroverted at a funeral. Ah. But as you mature, you're able to be introverted when the situation demands it, right? And everyone can do that. Like I had lots of introverts in my clinical practice who became very successful in business and they became, they learned to be extroverted. They still weren't extroverted by temperament. A lot of social activity still tired them out, but they'd learned the social skills step by step. And so they were still temperamentally extroverted, but when the situation required an extroverted response, you know, they had it. And, and one of the things that you do want in a mate, this is a sign of sophistication, is that they can be the person that the situation demands. Yes. That doesn't mean they blow in the wind, right? That's not the same thing as not having character. It's adaptive flexibility. Like, yeah. In fact, one of the identifying hallmarks of personality pathology, so that would be the personality disorders, is that someone with a personality disorder is the same person all the time. Oh, that's creepy. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. You don't want you don't want people adjusting their personality and like morphing into somebody else dependent on who they talk to because right. that's lying. Right. But the ability to read the room. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Some people yeah. don't have yeah, that. Yeah, well, and you can well, and that is a hallmark of that's a hallmark of maturation because it's a hallmark of the unfolding of character, even if you put yourself in new situations constantly, new genes turn on and code for new physiological structures. Like it isn't only that you learn, you do learn because you absorb more information, but you also change, you also change physiologically by forcing yourself, enticing yourself into a multitude of situations. You increase your adaptive flexibility. Now, in terms of who you look for in a partner, it's, it is important. My clinical experience certainly taught me that it's very difficult to produce sexual interest if that's lacking right so that's number one well it has yeah. that's like a gift i don't know if it's number one but i would say it's it it isn't going to work without it and it isn't doesn't look to me like it's something that you can nurture because maybe you find someone you really like and they're your best friend and you wish you were sexually attracted to them and you think maybe that'll come with time my experience i think i was agnostic about that because an optimist would hope that that would be possible but my experience was watching my clients try that no it didn't work and so you need a modicum of mutual physical interest and maybe more than a modicum um, intense would be good you know you the honesty of the person is yeah, it, that's I don't think there's anything more important than whether or not the person you're with is doing their best to act out and tell you the truth. Yeah, that's because no long term relationship can survive without trust and trust is dependent on honesty. So that's a that's a major you can get a long ways with very difficult problems if you're willing to communicate genuinely. Could we test? Could we put that into the dating app somehow? And yeah. Oh, that's there cool. are honesty, humility dimensions. The hexaco personality model tests honesty, humility, and it's probably the opposite of the dark tetrad. Great. So what happened when people built personality models is they got rid of all the evaluative words like good and evil or even good and bad, anything that looked like a value judgment. And then they discovered a five dimensional structure, the five dimensional structure that characterizes personality. And then that's been broken down into some variants like in on understand myself, we offer people two subcategories of each major trait. We called them aspects. But the evaluative words actually do index temperamental variability. In fact, they might be the primary index of important temperamental variability, and they were taken out of the models. Why? And then they snuck well, because if you kept all the evaluative words in the models, it collapsed into a single dimension when you did the statistical analysis. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. So, so everyone to, who was honest would answer one Well, and then the, uh, the other thing is the, the, uh, the, psych, the psychologists who built the personality models wanted them to be value-free. And there's some utility in that because a scientific, a set of scientific descriptors should in principle be value-free. Now, whether it's possible to have a value-free index of human temperament, that's a whole different question. But it's, it, it's possible in part like you can see that there's a normal distribution of agreeableness and you can't say that it's ethically better to be agreeable than to be disagreeable. They have 
positive elements and negative elements. Now, I think mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. say that it's worse to be a liar than to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so imagine anything that has that strictly moral dimension is being parsed out. Well, the problem with that is that it decreased the overlap between personality and psychopathology because psychopathological people are often narcissistic and Machiavellian and psychopathic. And now you've taken that out of the descriptive network. So that decreases the way that you can use personality to understand psychopathology. And then it opened up investigation into personality dimensions that weren't captured in the big five model. And that turned out to be honesty, humility. That's part of the hexical model, which is six dimensions. Or I think the opposite of that, which is the dark tetrad Interesting. proclivities. Right. And so that would be honest, reliable, humble on one end and prideful, narcissistic, arrogant, Machiavellian on the other. Do you and think we can get people to answer questions that show that and they would? Yes, Why wouldn't I know you just how to lie about Because I developed tests that make it impossible for people to lie. Great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've used those to identify narcissists and people with personality disorders. And they work. Now, that hasn't been extensively tested. But, but, and that's a flaw. But it's been tested. How much has it been tested? There's no better current alternative. That's how well it's been tested. So, and there are ways. The other thing you got to understand too is that if you're narcissistic, you tend to think that it's a virtue. Yeah. And it's also not that easy to lie consistently. It takes a lot of effort and you have to be motivated. Now, it turns out if you tell smart people that their personality tests are going to be used to evaluate their suitability for a job, they tilt them in the direction of conscientiousness and low neuroticism, which is exactly what they should do because those are the best predictors. And the, it collapses the five dimensional structure. So people can fake good. And you can imagine that more intelligent people can fake good better. And so that's a problem when you're trying to evaluate people using self reports for employment suitability. We developed a unfakeable big five that circumvents that mm -hmm. problem. It's got some other prices you have to pay for that but it does work. We paid people to cheat the unfakeable big five. I did that work with Jacob Hirsch and they couldn't do it. They could do it a bit, but not nearly as much as they could with the self reports. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And then Daniel Higgins and I worked out some tests that they were forced choice tests. Essentially, you have to admit to one of two bad things. Mm. And it's not obvious at all which of them is worse. And if it's only one comparison, then it probably doesn't make any difference. But if I know, maybe I have 20 paired questions I could ask you, and one answer is clearly more associated with long-term psychopathology than the other, even though both are negative, and you answer all the questions in a way that indicates the worst choice, then I can be reasonably certain that, you know, I've got you right. And so that's basically how we set up the tests. So they're very difficult to fake. I, I don't Great. think it's been a long time since I looked at the tests. It isn't obvious to me that I could fake them if I came across them now. Because both of the choices, for example, in the forced choice, the other, I think one of the things we did, if I remember correctly, is we have five bad choices and we know which, which order they're in and you have to put them in order. Mm. Right, right. And then if you put if you prioritize the wrong one, well, that's costly if you do it repeatedly across a lot of different questions. But yes, we think we can identify the narcissists and the psychopaths and the Machiavellians and the and the liars. It'd be really helpful on a dating app. It might be the most important thing, yes. Yeah, by the way, just so everybody knows too, and the women should really know this, those are the men who engage in short-term mating strategies. The, the clinical data on that are very clear. So, well, sex is just for fun. It's like, yeah, says the psychopath, right? And then part of the reason for that is because that is how the psychopath operates. And that's clearly, there's no dispute about that in the psychological literature. I'm not making this up. That's been well studied. Like the, we know, for example, that one of the things that characterizes children with a pronounced and relatively permanent antisocial bent is that they have sex earlier. That's been documented for decades, oh. decades, decades. Yeah, what's well, a short-term mating strategy? Well, antisocial behavior is a short-term strategy. It's like 
I'm going to get whatever I can from you now yeah. and from me and to hell with the consequences. It's like the definition of it's like the definition of criminal predation. So it's this isn't a surprise. It's just a logical consequence of the behavioral pattern. You know, what a criminal does is take advantage now, despite mm -hmm. the long term. Mm -hmm. It's the definition of criminal behavior. And so women should know this. It's like, if the guy's all about, well, you know, we're here for a good time, not a long time. Oh, he's such fun. It's like, yeah, no, he's actually not that much fun. And you're, you're, well, here's another thing we know. Young women are much more likely to be fooled by narcissistic psychopaths than older women. Well, why? Because they're... Well, they confuse, Naive. well, exactly. They don't understand that people can be malevolent. They confuse that malevolence with charm. And you can understand that because like, maybe a woman has a very agreeable guy. That'd be a friend usually. And she doesn't find him that attractive, right? And so then she finds someone disagreeable who's not disagreeable because he's got integrity of character, but because he's a psychopath. Yeah. But that I don't give a flying fuck about anyone else. Like there's a certain confidence that, Definitely. That that mimics, that that mimics. It's not confidence. It's false confidence. It's certainly not competence. But you know, if you're competent and secure, you don't care what other people think. But that doesn't mean that if you don't care about what other people think, you're confident and competent. Yeah. Right. But they can easily be confused. Right. Very so easily. This is partly why women need to say no whenever they have the opportunity to. It's a great test. And it's also, I talk to Tammy a lot about this. I think that's the primary way that women obtain status. Is saying no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, imagine you have women, they're being chased by high quality guys, say, and they have enough gall to say no. Yeah, it's because well, the they're above thinks, them, right? That's hmm, What's yeah. up with her? I'm so charming. How can she say no to me? How dare she say no to she me? She must well, be higher in status. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, this, I do believe the fundamental status marker I think men believe this. I'm, I'm certain of it. I mean, I remember, you know, having conversations with my teenage friends, you know, when we're all enamored of women, left, right, and center. <laughs> it's certainly the case that the women who said no, they were clearly, you know, there were the prudes who said no. That's not the same thing. But there were, then there were the women, or girls, I guess in this case, who were, you know, attractive and confident, who just kind of, you know, and that's... Men are, men, any men with sense are not only looking for that, but immediately attracted by it. And if it puts them off, like for the girls who are listening, if a man is put off by the fact that you say no, you should get the hell away from him as fast as you possibly can, because he doesn't care in the least for you. He doesn't find you interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's really good for young people to hear. Well, the other thing too, that women should know is that if a man sleeps with you and, and he doesn't respect you, he, he, the moment he's finished with you, he will have nothing but contempt for you. And girls are often brokenhearted, let's say, because they've slept with some guy and then he doesn't call them. It's like, I can tell you that that guy finished in bed. The first thing he wanted to do was get the hell out of there as fast as possible because it's sexual satiation and immediate disgust, contempt, and shame. Immediate, immediate. That's not good. You don't want to be the girl on the receiving end of that. There's nothing no. about that that's good. No. People should hear that. Yep. Yeah. And you do. I mean, I know that I ran into a lot of people that I now know were psychopaths as a young woman. For sure. And that's partly, I think, because I'm extroverted. And so, well, but also because I'm female. And so the extroverts are attractive. And it is the extroverts that don't really care about anything, that seem confident, that are attractive. But if you're a 21-year-old guy and well, you're like that... The, the temptation of a disagreeable extrovert is to be narcissistic, right? So every personality constellation has its associated pathologies. So the pathology of extroversion is mania. The pathology of disagreeable Girl, extroversion mania. is narcissism, <laughs> right? The pathology of introversion is depression in combination with neuroticism. Mm. So there isn't an attribute that you get without a corresponding temptation. Well, extroverts are interesting and enthusiastic and dominant in social situations and disagreeable people are pretty damn good at negotiating on their own behalf but disagreeable extroverts can become narcissistic now the problem is they're attractive so you know it's a tough it's a tough 
conscientious and, and can, you can, can help monitor yeah that. and you can get the people that aren't narcissists that are oh, also disagreeable and extroverted definitely and those people are great yeah right right but the narcissistic right. ones yeah well those are sort of like the tameable monsters the beauty and the beast fantasy right because the beast is obviously disagreeable i mean obviously mm -hmm. and well, and to rampage around is an extroverted sort of thing. I mean, nobody cares about the beast who hides in the back of his cave. So yeah, tameable, tameable beast is a good, it's hard though. It's hard. It's a hard needle to thread. And that's, you know, the problem that women face. Let, let's take a, a bit of a different direction given we're at the beginning of a new year. Um, I thought maybe you had some kind of tangible advice for people in making a new year plan so well the most tangible to, advice like, what should they do in order to think about the next year well the most tangible advice the most practical thing for people to do is to do the future authoring program because it lays out what to do in great detail and you can do it badly and quickly and it'll still help you a lot but so you can go to self-authoring and do the future authoring program and it helps you lay out a vision and people what we do to adapt to the uncertainty of the future is we lay a vision on it. We lay a vision on the chaos and we pursue the vision, right? And so it's exactly what you do when you're navigating a boat, right? You have a destination in mind and the waves rise and there's all sorts of variability, but you use the destination as the orienting point like the North Star and you calibrate your perceptions and your emotions in relationship to the goal. That's how we navigate and we're navigating creatures. When we say we, we know something, we don't mean we can describe it explicitly. That's what we think we mean when we say we know. That isn't what we mean. We mean that we have a navigation tool. We have an accurate map. And you need a map. And to map accurately, you need a destination. And there's no dif difference between specifying a destination and developing a vision. And so there's two ways you can develop a vision, roughly speaking. You can do it by the promptings of conscience or you can do it by the promptings of calling. It's like the interaction between those two things. That's like divine providence. So conscience would say to you, here's a bunch of stupid things you're doing that you could stop doing that would improve your life. Now, conscience can be too harsh a master, mm -hmm. right? So you have to enter into a dialogue with your conscience and you may have to enter into a relationship with it, like Pinocchio and Jiminy. Because Jiminy's just a tramp when he starts. Like, he has to learn too. So you have to have a dialogue with your conscience so that it isn't a tyrant or, or a pushover, right? But your conscience can tell you where there are things in your life that aren't going well. And you can use those as motivation to change. I Like, for example, when I decided to start stop drinking when I was 27 or thereabouts, Part of the reason for that, there were two reasons. One was a calling reason, one was a conscience reason. The conscience reason was, I looked at my life and I thought, well, when do I do things I regret? When I'm drinking. Well, do you want to ha have a life characterized by regret as you start climbing up the professional ladder and the consequences become more and more dire? And the answer was, well, and I'd established a more permanent relationship with Tammy and uh, you know, we were thinking about having kids. It's like, well, do I want that? Or would I rather have a life where I wasn't doing stupid things that I regretted? Mm -hmm. Well, and when I quit drinking, I I didn't stop doing everything I regretted, but I stopped doing like 90% of things I regretted. Yeah. Okay. So that, that and that's, that's very true for people who drink, period. Most, a tremendous amount of stupidity is alcohol fueled. So that was the conscience end. The calling end was I couldn't write when I was hungover. Yeah, it was that's impossible. I couldn't make quality. I wasn't operating at peak efficiency. And maybe that's fine if, if you don't care. But I, one of the things that really motivated me and that's continued to motivate me ever since is I'm very curious about how much I can do in the shortest possible period of time. That's fun. And so if anything gets in the way, it's like, well, it, it's got to go. That's sacrifice. That's the sacrifice that pleases God to dispense with the lesser to facilitate movement towards the greater. Well, so if you're trying to develop a vision, well, you can start with that. And in the future authoring program, we walk people through a series of questions. Because the real question is, well, how do you want your life to proceed? But that's pretty generic. And if you're not 
accustomed to self-reflection you haven't been socialized so that you're self-reflective you don't even know where to start you know people will say well what do you, what do you want to do with your i don't know well that's not a very good answer it means you're vague as hell but it may be true so you can ask yourself more specific questions where's the value in your friendships and how could you foster that you know and those are hard questions like maybe you have friends that aren't that good for you you know it's highly probable you know and you might think well you know they're my longest term friend and i've i've been away, around with them forever and the answer is well if they're aiming down man and if, if they're the sort of people who will pull you down when you start to move up you are not doing them any favors by allowing them to get away with that so don't be thinking that you know you can put up with someone indefinitely just because you have had a long-term relationship with them and that doesn't mean you shouldn't be loyal the question is loyalty to what if you're facilitating misbehavior on the part of someone you love that's not loyalty right at some point loyal is like fuck you i've had enough and you better change because you're headed in a bad direction and i'm not going to be around to watch it and that's love to say that if it's true so what do you want from your friends friends and what can you give them like so the the real question is it's like who's the right person for me when you're thinking about dating isn't the right question it's like what can i offer to people is the right question if you answered that question you'd have no problem with dating right okay so it's just backwards but so how 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 would you want your friendships to be constituted your relationships with your family your mother did a stellar job of this about 20 years ago she decided she was going to clean up her relationships with her sisters her, and her brother and her dad and she did that first by taking a look at what she was bringing to the table there was trouble it's like you can't fix someone else's trouble but you can certainly figure out what you're doing that's stupid and what she was primarily doing that was causing her trouble was insisting on her point of view and she wanted to she was the youngest kid in the family she had reason to want her viewpoint to be appreciated but she just let that go she didn't put her viewpoint forward anymore and then her sisters started to talk to her and tell her what was going on and she listened and then she got to know them and eventually she got to say something now and then that they would listen to you know and and she straightened that right out so you can do that with your family you have to have a vision you know how would you like your family affairs to lay themselves out and where do you want your career to go and what do you how are you going to educate yourself and how are you going to take care of yourself mentally and physically and you have to ask yourself this question the question is very straightforward if you could have what you wanted what would it be well people rarely ask themselves that question and they bloody well rarely stick around for the answer they also Is, limit themselves oh terribly like it, it's amazing it's amazing what you can do with a plan and you could say what do i want and i'd say shoot high oh yeah it's because it, it's crazy once you put it on paper and you think about it mm -hmm. you start uh, devote your attention or efforts yeah to it. you start recognizing opportunity that leads in mm -hmm. that direction so you might as well shoot high and see what happens yeah, well, this idea, there's a kind of a new age idea of manifesting. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's a core of truth in it because the way your perceptual systems are set up is that once you specify a target, you preferentially attend to the world in a manner that makes the objects that exist in accordance with that target much more salient. That's how you navigate. You know, if you're going to walk from here to the next yard, what's going to stand out for you are the things you have to walk around right because otherwise you won't get there well that's everything is like that once you set a goal as soon as you set a goal the world lays itself out for you pathways forward facilitators and obstacles and everything else that's irrelevant yeah. right right that's how the perceptual and emotional systems work so and then you might say well how do they work if you have no goal and the answer is well they're thrown into chaos there's too many choices there's no direction you're anxious you and you're confused well that's not a good way to, of propagating yourself along the pathway mm -hmm. you know and with regards to the difficulty of the goal there's rules for that too if you have a child you love you and you give them a task you want to set them up for success which means they have some probability of attaining the goal compared to the effort exerted the animal literature seems to indicate 
for example, that if you pair animals together to play, the loser animal has to win a third of the time. So one of the things you could say is like a high end goal for you might be one where you have a 65% chance of failing. Right. So you don't want it to be a 99.9% .9 chance of failing. I mean, there might no, be circumstances. No. Well, there might be circumstances under which that really high end goal is worth achieving if the payoff is massive and you can break it up into sub goals yeah. where the, where the prob probability of victory is higher. But you want to play a fair game with yourself. And the game is, see, there's two games going on at the same time. One is, can you attain the goal? But the other is, can you expand your adaptive competence while you're attaining the goal? And that's why you don't want to just set a goal that for sure you can hit. Yeah. Right, because if for sure you can hit it, it doesn't stretch you. And the goal is to stretch plus to climb. And, and you don't want to set goals that... I mean, I said shoot high, but mm -hmm. for instance, like my goal with exercise this year, because I've got really sick last year and I haven't been exercising for a long time. And then I had a pregnancy and my goal for exercising was twice a week for 15 minutes each time. Right, right. And it was like going from zero to that, that There's would a be a huge step oh, yeah, in the right yeah. direction. Oh, and then, and then I have like after that, three times a week for 30 minutes each session. So you don't well, shoot there's, high, so well, you're not going to do it. Well, there's also a rule there too. So imagine that you decide twice a week for 15 minutes and then it's a month and you didn't do it. So you don't say, oh, I'm an idiot and I'm a failure and this will never work. You say, well, how about once a week for 15 minutes? And then if that doesn't work, it's like, how about once a week for 10 minutes? <laughs> like, well, seriously, yeah. th there's a rule and the rule is aim at the goal in case of failure either discipline yourself because maybe there's some things you can sort out or scale the goal back somewhat until you do it. Well, this is a very, this is humility. That's humility. Scale the goal back till you do it. That's humility because that's actually taking yourself into account as you are. And that can be bitter, especially if you're trying to develop in an area where you're weak because you may have to start very low. Like but, exercise once a week for 10 minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I dealt with an old guy who was about 83 at one point and he had a rough life, man. He had fallen off a ladder and broke his neck oh. and he was permanently fused in a very awkward and uncomfortable position. Oh. Right. And he was in chronic pain and, and he was old and he couldn't do much. And so he kind of had it. He was laying in bed, depressed out of his mind. And he, he would have just, if maid would have been available, he would have taken it in a second, like all depressed people, by the way. So what was, what we, what did we do for him? God, I think we started with, I think I started with, can you look at a magazine for 30 seconds? Aww. And then the next step was, can you sit up in bed? But by two weeks, we had him walking up and down the hallway. You know, like his life was never going to be stellar. But the reason I'm using him as an example is because I don't care how impaired you are. There's something that you could do that is a slight improvement over where you're at. And you might think, oh my God, it's so depressing to consider that I have to start that slow. It's like, fair enough. But, but this is where another fact of life comes into play. Progress tends not to be linear. It tends to be curvilinear like this, almost exponential. Or geometric and so you can start pretty damn minimally and you'll speed up if you're consistent you'll speed up pretty rapidly so you don't have to worry about having to start like a fool this is why Jung said the fool is the precursor to the savior you have to allow yourself to be the kind of idiot that you actually are to begin with this is something you need to know when you're imagine you're trying to what would you say train your partner to do the dishes, you know, regularly. Your goal might be they do the dishes immediately after dinner, seven nights a week, or maybe three, because you do it half the time, whatever it happens to be. And they do a good job. Well, that's not necessarily where to start. Once badly would be a start. And that's a huge start because once is way more than zero. Yeah. Way more. You know, and then you have to be patient and you have to allow the person, including yourself, to stumble forward stupidly a lot. So when I used to counsel my clients, for example, to go out on dates with their 
partners. They were both, they'd both just hate that idea. And then they'd go out and have a miserable time. And then they'd come back and trumpet triumphantly the misery of their date so that they never had to do that again. And it took a lot of talking to walk through, like it's like, if you're married, you're gonna be, let's say you're married for 30 years and you could have three dates a week, you know, three times of intimacy and, and close personal relationship a week. Let's say it's three, that's not bad. Two to three is probably about right. So let's say three. So it's a hundred a year, it's 3,000 over 30 years. Well, if you have to do that stupidly a hundred times as you're practicing, it's like it's only a hundred over 3,000. It's nothing. It's a tiny fraction of the total. So you can stumble forward stupidly and you need to allow your partner that luxury. You can teach them slowly and you can reward progress as well as performance. Hmm. Good thing to apply to yourself. So if yeah. you manage to exercise, you know, once a week for 10 minutes, like you give yourself a little pat on the, you don't have to go overboard. You're don't not put queen it on of the Instagram. universe. Yeah. Look at me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that could be a reasonable way of obtaining social support for it. You know? Yeah. We'll see. I think I can manage that. I hope I can manage mm -hmm. that. I could really use some exercise. Um, how should people manage jealousy? Well, one of the things you want, the first thing I think you probably want to think through is, um, you want a partner that no one else wants? <laughs> Definitely not. Well, but you actually have to think that through because the answer could easily be yes. Like husbands will punish their wives out of dressing attractively. They do that all the time. And then they're all bitchy because their wives, she really let herself go. It's like, well, that's because you punished her mercilessly every time she looked like any man might take a second glance at her, you stupid bastard. And you did that because you're unconscious and jealous. And now you're resentful because your wife listened to you. It's a pretty stupid strategy. So you have to think like, do you want a partner that other people would find attractive? And, and there's a possibility that the answer to that is no. And the reason is, is because you're insecure and perhaps for valid reasons about whether or not you're actually much of a catch. And so then maybe you should do some sorting out about that. It's like, well, let's say you think you're not much of a catch. Okay, there's two possible reasons for that. One is you're not much of a catch. The other is you're too hard on yourself. And it's probably gonna be a little of both. Like maybe you had a hypercritical father, for example, and nothing you ever did was good enough or something like that. Or a like hyper, that. hyper conservative. What about those people? I'll give you an yeah. example. I'm gonna talk about this. We'll okay. see if Jordan's okay with this. Okay. When Jordan and I first started dating, or when I met him, I was wearing like short shorts and a crop top. Because yeah. I figure, I can only wear a crop top for so long. I'm going to wear it now. Yeah. Um, and he, and then he told me he wanted to marry me and then we got married and everything. And about six months into the relationship, he kind of just like slightly negged all the like outfits like that. Yeah. So eventually I had no crop tops because I was yeah. like, if you don't want me to wear it, I'm not going to wear it. Yeah. I like wearing them. I don't think there's anything wrong with them. Yeah. But, um, they're gone. Yeah. And then about six months after that, he goes, <laughs> where are your crop tops? Yeah, well, where are all those clothes? Right. And I was like, you, they're gone. Right, right. Anyway, so he's well, reverted well, back. Well, I do but... think. Well, I do think that that's actually a place where husbands and wives can negotiate. You know, like I like buying Tammy clothes, and we've, I actually like it quite a bit, as it turns out. And we've had a lot of discussions about what's appropriate, what's sexy, when and where to come to a, to a, agreement about that. Now, I would say she's less flashy by temperament in her mode of self-display than you are. So, you know, Tammy is more understated, probably because she's less extroverted. Oh, definitely then. I'm not understated. Yeah, right, right. And so, and I'm not jealous. So that's not been a problem. But I like, like, I'm perfectly happy for her to be attractive. Now, if I was jealous, well, we, we can go through the reasons. You're not much of a catch. You're too hard on yourself. So you don't think you're much of a catch. The other is your, your wife is actually on the prowl. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that, that all has to be them. sorted out. And she can be on the prowl kind of unconsciously, you know. And, and that's even hard to sort out because to some degree, being a bit on the prowl is playful. 
right? Because you don't want to go to a party where no one flirts at all. A good party, even among people who are married and happily yeah. married, is there's an, there's an edge, but it takes a lot of sophistication to walk that precisely, right? You have to be awake. It's a complicated game. Yeah, and, like, it's a, and it's also a friendly edge, right? Yes, it's Between a friendly, people. Yes, yeah. and, it, and it's a friendly edge where everyone is playing. Yeah, and that only works if you have trust in that, the relationship. That, yes, that's too. right, that's right, that's yeah. right. Well, so there's, you know... If you're jealous, it means if you're jealous, there's a lot of ugly things in your relationship and your psyche that need to be sorted out. That's the first thing you can be sure of. And it, you, the second thing you can be sure of is it's going to be really convenient of you to assume that it's your partner's fault. Now, having said that, hey, you could start with the a priori presumption that it's 50% your partner's fault. Probably isn't because if you're the jealous, here's another question you can ask yourself if you're jealous. Have you been jealous in every relationship? And if the answer to that is yes, it's either, well, you're either picking them pretty badly, they're a sport, which is your problem anyways, or you're the problem. Yeah. All women, those women, they always make me jealous. It's like, no, sorry, buddy, that's you. Now, that doesn't mean you could have, you could have also been picking women who really don't care much for you and who are sort of with you maybe because you've enticed them into feeling sorry for you and they really are on the lookout for someone else and no wonder like that could easily be the situation yeah yeah but well, jordan's reverted yeah and so what was the what was the what was the agreement i think i just kind of like was like well if that's what he wants that's fine it didn't really yeah. bother me that much it was just like i don't think that's necessary like that was my opinion. I don't think that's necessary. What's not I'm necessary? Not, well, like saying I'm, you know, no to the crop tops or no to like just certain outfits. I yeah. was like, I don't think that's necessary because I don't think I'm going overboard and I'm not looking for anybody. So I think that's not necessary. But if that makes you uncomfortable, then okay. Well, so that right. was kind well, of my I, no, but, opinion but, but, uh, for no, a while. But I think that's right. I but think he's reverted. So well, now he's you also, like, you also like assuming that your husband is, you know, vaguely reasonable. You don't want to dress in a manner that makes him uncomfortable. Yeah. Now you have to sort out whether that's reasonable. Like with your mom, if she asks me what I think of something she's wearing, I just tell her. Now I really like her sense of style. And so the probability that I'm going to be happy with what she's wearing is quite high, but it's not always that the case. And you could say, well, I could have just always said it was wonderful, but well, then that compromises your word. It also makes it impossible for me to trust, for her to trust me. In, in my discussion of what she's wearing. And it's also, see, a man will also tell a woman, oh, you look great in everything, honey. And what he means by that is, he could mean a bit, like, I think you're sexy, so what difference does it make? But it could also mean, I don't well, I don't really want to pay any attention to your yeah. damn clothes, and so I wish you'd shut up, and if I give you a compliment, maybe you won't ask me to think anymore. <laughs> right, and that's not helpful, because actually, how your partner dresses like it's not the most important thing in life by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not nothing. And it also can be fun, mm -hmm. very fun in fact. So it's one of the things that adds variation to your relationship. So that's why you can't just think the whole fashion world is like pointless and shallow, even though it is pointless and shallow. It's not, you know. <laughs> well, there's an aspect of it. If it's raised to the highest place, it becomes pointless and shallow. But in its place, it's like, well, why not just wear a sack? Also, people com treat you completely differently yes, depending on do. what clothes you wear. Well, that, that, so you might as well use that to your advantage depending on what you want to get out of people. Mm -hmm. It's like, what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. Well, this is especially true in things like job interviews. Yeah. It's like, you're going to put your best foot forward or not? It's like, learn how to wear a suit, you dimwit. Well, I don't want to work for someone who judges me on my appearance. It's like, well, good. Then be a slob. And cover yourself with Cheeto dust and live in the basement where you don't see anyone and nurse delusions of your moral superiority. That sounds like fun. You could do that or buy a suit, you dimwit. You know, it's like, really, there's just no excuse for that. And there's a tremendous amount of intellectual, it's like the people who say, I don't have time for small talk. It's like, well, People aren't going to bear their hearts to you the first second they meet you. They're going to tell you something trivial to see if you're so stupid you can't even respond to that. And, you know, I don't have time for small talk generally means I have no social skills. And so why, of course, mm -hmm. people aren't going to engage. Now, it's a little more complicated because people high in openness want to move to a discussion of ideas. And so they're not interested in just like local gossip, you know. Yeah. 
so that's a complicating factor. But that aside, small talk has its place. It's like you got to check each other out a bit before you talk about anything where there's a consequence. Do you think, just going back to a different area of a conversation, do you think we could make a course for Peterson Academy that taught, like specific to people that taught introverts to be extroverted in certain situations? Because you said you had clients yes. that you taught to be extroverted. Oh, definitely. Oh, I bet that would be really helpful for people. Yeah, yeah. And agreeable people, That's how to be training. disagreeable. We should do that in a course. Well, that's that, an that could be, idea. That, that could be, be incredibly fun. helpful. Like, well, that would be something, if we did that in a course, what we should probably do is find someone who's agreeable and wants to be more disagreeable and, and teach train them. them and film it and edit it. That's a way more effective way of doing that. So you think you could train agreeableness to be more no, disagreeable? No, I know I know I can because I did it lots. Look, people come to therapy for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because they're in a life situation that's very, very complex and they need to think their way through it. Sometimes it's because they're suffering from a surfeit of negative emotion, anxiety or depression. But the third most common rush, rationale is for assertive, assertiveness training. Yeah. yeah, well, it's not assertiveness, it's that. disagreeableness. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, and basically what it is in some ways, it's negotiating strategy. Yeah. You know, and what I taught a lot of my clients, a lot of my clients tripled their income in two or three years because we put together a plan. And part of that was how to position yourself so you can be disagreeable. To position yourself to properly be disagreeable, you have to position yourself so that you know when to say no and so that you do and can say no. So like if you're my boss and I need something from you to continue working happily for you, which should be my aim, I have to have, I have to be confident enough when I approach you to put forward my case without fear. Well, so that means at minimum, like if you came to me and said, well, you want to work to get a raise from your boss and you're afraid of it. Mm -hmm. So no, well, it's a strategy, it's okay. Bring your CV next week. Let's take a look. Well, I don't want to. It's full of holes. It's like, yeah, that's your life, full of holes. <laughs> your life is full of holes, so you have no foundation to stand on, so you can't negotiate. So bring your CV and we'll go through it and we'll see what holes are rectifiable. Maybe that'll take a year or two years, right? Because you're afraid you can't find another job as good as the one you have. You think it was a fluke that you got this job because you're kind of underqualified. You don't know how to advertise your skills. You don't even know how to make a case for yourself. So you're terrified of going to talk to your boss. Well, all that has to be like straightened out. That well, has maybe to be straightened you should out. be terrified. <laughs> right. Well, exactly. Now, people are often more terrified than they should be because most, look, bosses, if they have any sense, are just as afraid of losing good employees as the employee is of losing their job. Definitely. And if your boss isn't afraid of losing you and you're good, it's time to find a new boss, right? That's just a sign you're in a counterproductive place. So it's not like you, the boss has all the playing cards. It's just not true. Like, and certainly- That's definitely true. Oh, definitely. And managers, like people who go to job interviews are terrified generally, but the people who are doing the interviews are even more terrified if they have any sense, because they know perfectly well that if they hire a dud, they're stuck with them like forever, especially in a mid-level corporation and, or in Canada. and their life or in Canada or the, and their life can just be hell. So you, there's, you hold plenty, if you're a good employee, you hold plenty of cards. And so what I would do with my clients is first of all, it's like, okay, are you in a bargaining position? And that might be, do you have enough? Are you competent? Are you demonstrably competent? Does your boss know you're competent? Do you have the confidence to go along with that? And have you advertised yourself in a manner that's commensurate with your competence? Well, probably not. So we'd sort all that out. And then it's like, well, then what do you want? And more than that, what are you offering? Like if you go to yeah. someone who's halfway reasonable and you say, look, um, I'd like to be wholeheartedly able to donate 25% more effort to my job Here's what I've done already. And here are the impediments. You know, I have to have another job because I'm not making enough. And also when I work for you in such and such way, I don't get any credit for it. And this is demoralizing me. And so what I want is a 15% raise with the possibility of a 25% raise three years down the road. And here's what I'm willing to offer in return. And this is why it's to your advantage. Well, 
That's the case you want to, you don't go in there and think, I you say, I think I deserve a raise. It's like, everyone wants a raise, buddy. That's mm. not a strategy. Right, right. So one of the things that when you teach someone to be assertive, to be, say, more disagreeable, is you're putting them in a position to negotiate, to say no. And, the, and what you want to have in your back pocket with any discussion you have with a, with a, uh, like a supervisor is your final option is to say, say yeah. Nora, man, I've got other options. If you don't have other options, you're in no place to negotiate for a raise. Yeah. If you have no other options, you're being paid as much as you deserve. Right, exactly. That's why you settled for it to begin with. So you want to put yourself in a position where you have options. This and is, I've listened to you for so long that this is how I negotiate with you. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good, right, right. Well, that's worked. That, yeah. Well, look, when we negotiated our businesses, both you and Julian did the same thing. In the major negotiation you went through first, you know, you were very interested in Peterson Academy. But what I wanted to hear from you is, okay, you're interested in Peterson Academy. All right, so I want you to do like an outstanding job. Okay, well, what's the price? And so what I want to hear from you is, under what conditions are you willing to do a stellar job? And I don't want some snow job. I want to know. And I want to know it for decades. It's like, no, no, I want you maximally motivated. Now, if you're demanding so much that it would decrease my motivation, well, then I have to tell you that. It's like, no, I can't offer you that. Because then if you had pushed too hard, all this is especially true if you're dealing with people that have options. So let's say you got one over me in the negotiation and it turned out that it was 75% for you, so to speak, and 25% for me. Well, all that would happen is I deprioritize that yeah, endeavor. I well, I wanted that's not you, helpful. Like during that negotiation, I wanted you with both feet in. Right, absolutely. Given everything else you're doing. Exactly. And anytime yeah. you're negotiating with someone who has options, you have to think, you don't be, you're not thinking, how do I get the best possible deal? No. Or, or you reconstruct what best possible deal means. If you're dealing with someone who's competent, best deal is they'll pay attention. Mm -hmm. Right. So you got to think of it from their perspective. If I was in their shoes, so I don't remember exactly what we negotiated with Peterson Academy. I think you own the majority. 55. Right, right. So that puts 45. the decision making responsibility on your shoulders. Now, you know, a cynic would say, well, now you have the power. Well, that's stupid because if you're using power, well, first of all, you're not going to get very far with me because I'll just go do something else. But also, well, the also right way of thinking about that is no, no, you have the responsibility. And that means I can go off and do other things. Not that I'm not attending, but that I, yeah. you know, so, and I would rather that this was your baby fundamentally. Like, well, how is that not useful to me? Well, I want to micromanage everything. It's like, well, if I you want to micromanage everything, why am I going to partner with you? Yeah. That's another thing for people who are listening. If you're a micromanager, you're, you're either bent in your perception of value or you're dealing with the wrong people. Yeah. You, you shouldn't have to have micromanage to someone. People. That's the wrong person. Yeah. You want to be around people. You think, oh, you did a great, you want to think, oh, you did really, if you're fortunate, you think, oh, you did a way better job on that than I would have. Then you know you got the right person, man. And then, of course, jealousy can arise. It's like, well, that person's so competent. It's like, this is one of the things I loved about working with Bob Peel, my grad supervisor. Bob was, had his feet firmly enough on the ground, and he was a very competent person. He's sort of multidimensionally competent, you know? There was a lot of things that Bob was good at. He was a very balanced person. And he had zero envy of his students. If he had a student who was shining in some particular way, it was like, that was just fine with Bob. Good. Yeah, yeah it was you great. Need to it take was great. Credit for what other people do. That's such it. A just way. means you're not doing your own thing enough. That's all it means. Mm -hmm. There's plenty for everyone to do. Plenty. And if you don't think there is, you have a Malthusian view of the world. Zero sum. There's only so much. <laughs> and if I get seventy percent, you can only have thirty. It's like no. I think that can also come from working with a lot of incompetent people, though. And then you're like, okay, well, I only want to give away 5% because I'm going to do anything anyway, everything anyway. Right. Well, so then that might just not be partnering with the right people. Well, that's part of it that, that, and that may be part of being too agreeable as well. Right. Cause you just say yes to, I, I gave him a chance. Don't give people chances, you know, and I'm not saying that like the son of a bitch who never gives anyone a chance. It's like, if you're trying to hire someone, giving someone a chance is a very bad reason. 
It's not helpful. Oh, it's not yeah. helpful to them. It's not, it's not helpful to anyone. It might make you feel good about yourself morally for 15 minutes. It's a very bad strategy. Yeah. You know, no, that doesn't mean that with careful analysis, you couldn't take a risk on someone young yes. and inexperienced, but you would have had to evaluate them very carefully to see if the risk was, well, that's what happened with you when you started working with me. Like, you know, I knew you Definitely didn't know enough to do what you were doing, but I figured. I didn't know anything. That first year was intense. I didn't know anything about anything. I remember having conversations with your agent, not knowing what a green room was. Send over his rider. I was like, you're going to have, sorry, Justin, you're going to have to explain that too. I was like, I'm going to be asking for a lot of words for the next, yeah, right. for the next six yeah, months well, when to you a start, year. When you start Apologies. Something new, well, when you start something new, you don't know anything. What you did start with, as far as I was concerned, is I figured that you could learn it and that you would. And you did. Thank you. Well, it's good been, work. It's been fun been some ups definitely. and downs but it's definitely been fun yeah well it's it's there's no shortage of challenge in what we're doing and that's good yeah yeah no you've done real well and i'm very curious that's the other thing that 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 delegation especially to your kids is useful for it's like i'm curious it's like okay here's an opportunity i've always been curious about this with people like you know in my lab i handed out opportunities to people all the time mm -hmm. it's like oh you think you have a clue do you here Go see yeah. what you can do with this. You know, and sometimes people come back, they just knock it out of the park. It's like, here's another one for you. And then other times people come back and say, here's seven reasons I couldn't do it. It's like, yeah. Okay. That's just, they had seven reasons too. Not always, you know, sometimes you have to have some sense. You know, if everybody's, if the, if all their family members got killed in a car accident, you know, you could probably take that into consideration. That's kind of that's kind of how I felt with Jordan when we started working with him, which was which which here, one, just here, which Jordan my my oh, your husband my husband Jordan, Jordan. Mm. but it was like I'd give him I was like I need help I'm over like I'm yep. doing way too many things at the same time I could use somebody I communicate with all the time because either way either way I needed to work with somebody closely mm -hmm. to help manage the companies mm -hmm. and so I was like that might as well be my husband otherwise I'm going to be in constant communication with somebody else. Mm -hmm. so that's not ideal mm -hmm. and so that's kind of how I felt with him which was like well here's a bunch of stuff what happens and then it's been great obviously well hooray yeah it's expanded my capacity yeah in, well in, I would say something very similar has happened with I mean Tammy and I always cooperated especially around the kids well and that was our prime well I would say that that was probably perfectly suitable because the period of time I'm talking about was the period of time that was primarily occupied by kids. Then afterwards, you know, everything blew up around me and she decided she was going to get on board and she's just expanded her competence massively as a consequence. It's been great eh? because it wasn't obvious to us yeah. what we would do once our kids left. That's oh, a problem wow. that everybody well, that's faces. Been, that's been taken that's, care that's, of nicely. That, that's definitely taken oh, care of. Oh, what if we don't have much to do? Better make a yeah, plan. Yeah, well, we weren't Here worried about <laughs> that exactly, but we were uncertain about what would be the mutual focal point of our life, uh, right? Because okay. kids unite you. It's a joint project. And so a lot of marriages run into difficulty once the kids leave because the joint project has evaporated. And then what do you do? Well, we don't have that problem. At the you moment. certainly do not no. have that problem. No. Well, thank you, Dad, for coming on my podcast. Good luck with the. Oh, we might as well just say for everybody, he's going on tour again. Tickets are still available. JordanBPeterson.com, 51 cities across the United States. I'm going to do what I did in the Genesis lectures in the Exodus seminar, yeah. except more broadly, I'm going to walk through the stories that organize our imagination. That's the right way of thinking about it. Right. A, a culture is a shared corpus of stories. And the stories are the foundation. And we have foundational stories in the West, and those are stories derived from the Judeo-Christian tradition, for better or worse. And I'm going to explain why that's the case and how that's for better, not for worse. Because they're very 
profound stories. And you can tell that not least because we have the cultures upon which the cultures that are predicated upon those stories are highly functional. That's a hint. It's a hint. It's not proof. It's a hint. Oh. Or at least it's an indication that other forms of organization are to be regarded with extreme skepticism. Mm -hmm. Like communism, for example, or fascism. Well, mm -hmm. good luck with that tour. That should be fun. And then Peterson Academy is launching late February. Yeah. Your book is going to be released November. That's the plan. And then maybe we'll get started on this dating app with all our free time. Mm -hmm. Sounds like mm -hmm. fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's all sorts of sub projects nested in there. Yep. So. Okay, well, thanks again. Nice seeing you. Nice seeing you over Christmas and everything. It's been fun. It's been real good. Yeah, and congratulations on your baby. Thank you. Yeah, and your husband. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.